Well, dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, in one of the uh, most beloved and well-known parables, you know the story, I'm sure, very well, the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus tells the story of a man who is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And as he's traveling on this road that is a little bit dangerous, sure enough, there are some robbers there that are hiding. They jump out and they rob the man. They beat him up. They leave him half dead on the side of the road. And shortly thereafter, two of his fellow countrymen come by. They walk by, but for various reasons, they don't stop to help. And then along comes this foreigner, this despised Samaritan. The Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along well. And not only does this Samaritan stop and help and bind the man's wounds, but he also puts him on his animal and brings him uh, to an inn where he pays the bills and he assures that this man who was left half dead on the side of the road is going to be well taken care of and fully recover. And then Jesus asks us in the text, after he tells the story, who is the neighbor? Who's the one who acted most like a neighbor to this man? And of course the answer is, it was the foreigner. It was the Samaritan. So Jesus teaches us and scripture teaches us over and over again to love our neighbors as ourselves even when those neighbors are somewhat different than we are. And that's part of the reason anyway for this short series on taking a look at the three Abrahamic or Abrahamic faiths, those faiths or world religions that can trace their roots back through uh, the person of Abraham. Last week, we talked about Judaism. Remember, Abraham and Sarah had a son named Isaac, and through Isaac, God's covenant continued. Uh, the nation of Israel was begun, and through this great nation of Israel, God blesses the world. And for we as Christians, we see that as uh, most fully in that Jesus coming through the nation of Israel. But Abraham also had another son, it was not through Sarah, but it was through uh, a maidservant named Hagar. And Hagar became pregnant, and she had a son named Ishmael. Ishmael. And God promised a nation to come through Abraham and then through his son Ishmael as well. And this nation has become much of the Arab and the Muslim world. So Islam, the world religion Islam, traces its beginnings back to Abraham and his son Ishmael. Now I reminded you last week, if you were here, that Muslims in our world population make up about 24% of the world's population. So just about one in four people around the world uh, are part of the, the uh, world religion Islam, 1.8 billion people. Compared to about 31%, or almost one in three, who adhere to Christianity, or 2.3 billion Christians around the world. Now, I don't claim to be an expert on Islam in any way, shape, or form, but I have read quite a bit, and I've taught a series of classes on Islam and on other world religion. So I want to, what I want to do today in this sermon that is kind of a teaching sermon as we move through this series is to do two things. Simply first, to give you a little bit of history on Muhammad, who is the uh, founder of Islam and the uh, final prophet uh, in the, the Muslim's view. And then after that, take a look at some of the essential beliefs of Islam as well. And then see both the similarities and differences with our own faith, Christianity. And I do this so that you can, and we all can, come to a better understanding of our neighbor's faith, to maybe get rid of any unreasonable fears that may be there, and ultimately to love one another. And I think in the process, as we dig into other world religions, our own faith gets strengthened and our own faith gets sharpened as we see what it is that we truly believe and how that's different and how it's important for us. So first, a little bit of history on Muhammad. 
The Prophet Muhammad was the founder of Islam, and he was born in Saudi Arabia, in the city of Mecca, in the year 570 AD. So that's roughly six centuries uh, following uh, the life of Jesus. Uh, Muhammad died in the year 632 AD, so Muhammad lived to uh, the age of 62. Now, Muhammad's father died when he was just an infant, and his mother died when he was only six years old. So Muhammad was raised by, mostly by one of his uncles. And he was, as he grew uh, into an adult, a very successful businessman. He worked the trade routes and he was in the trading business uh, there in Saudi Arabia, mostly between Mecca and Medina where he lived after a while. Um, Muhammad got married at the age of 25. Uh, he had one wife uh, only and she died some 24 years later. So he was married to her, the love of his life, for 24 years. They had six kids together. Uh, two were boys. The first two were boys, and they died in infancy. And the next four were girls or daughters, and they lived uh, on into adulthood. Now, Muhammad was, as I dig into his life, uh, what you might call a spiritual seeker. He studied a lot. He, 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 he didn't read in his day. There were many people in his day that weren't educated enough to read, but he did listen and he learned and he knew the stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament. He knew our scriptures very, very well. He was a spiritual seeker and he dug in. So he was convinced that the God of the Jews and the God of the Christians was the one true God. And in Arabic, God is translated Allah. Like in Spanish, it's translated Dios. There are different names for God in different languages. In the Arabic, it's Allah. Christians in the Arab world uh, refer to God as Allah as well. That's the word translated. But a long story short, at the age of about 40, Muhammad uh, was praying, and he was a man of prayer. He prayed a lot. But he went off by himself and he was in a cave. He went into a little cave that he would often go to to spend some time in prayer. And he said at this particular time, he was about 40 years old, he said that he felt while he was praying in this cave a lot of pressure on his chest. He felt another presence and there was pressure. And then he said that he heard the word recite, recite. And he heard it over and over again, and he said that he said out loud, recite what? What is it that I am to recite? And the angel Gabriel, he said, appeared to him. He said that Gabriel was speaking, being a messenger for God, and gave him words to speak. He said he didn't know if he was kind of going crazy or if this really was God. He talked to his friends afterwards about it, and they said, what did he tell you to recite? And so as Muhammad told his friends, they wrote down his words verbatim, word for word, of what it is that he felt the angel Gabriel said to him. This happened to Muhammad, Muhammad uh, periodically for the rest of his life, for the next 22 years. Periodically he would have this sense that Gabriel was speaking to him, that it was God's voice speaking to him. And every time that happened, he would share with his friends, they would write it down, and that has become what we call the Quran. That is the Quran. The Quran is translated simply recitations. That's what that word means. It means the recitations of Muhammad. And there became uh, people who followed these writings, became followers of Muhammad, and slowly then the uh, religion, the world religion of Islam, grew and grew. Now, since Muhammad knew the Bible very well, many of the same characters that we have in our Bible appear in the Quran. I don't know if you knew that or not, but Adam and Eve are there. Moses is there. David is there. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is there. Jesus is even there. Jesus appears in the Quran about 70 times. Um, some of the stories are a bit different, but uh, Muhammad recited uh, many of the miracles of Jesus, and he said that Gabriel recited them. Some of them are very similar to our scriptures. Some of them have been changed and are a little bit different. And during the time of Muhammad's life, there were a lot of skirmishes or battles or even outright wars going on uh, between the cities like Mecca, where he was born and lived for a while, 
and the city of Medina, which I believe is about 200 miles away, uh, where he also lived as an adult for a while. There were these wars going on. And so as he dictated the Koran, as he said God was speaking to him through the angel Gabriel, some of it had to do with those wars. It had to do with how you treat your enemies in war. It had to do with how you treat prisoners of war. That's where some of the violent passages that are there and present in the Koran have their roots. There's a lot more that we could say about Muhammad. It's very interesting to dig into his life. So I encourage you to do that a little bit more on your own. But I want to move now from Muhammad, as I said, to some of the essential beliefs of Islam. What is it that Muslims believe? The word Islam has the same root word as the word shalom. You can hear the similarities, shalom, Islam. So for Muslims, they say at the root of their religion is that word uh, peace or peace be with you. But Islam can also be translated and is more commonly translated as a submission, submitting to God. They believe that their whole lives are to be submitted or in submission to God. That's not unlike us, as we believe that God calls us to submit ourselves, to give our whole lives over to God uh, so that God can use us in powerful ways. For Muslims, there are five pillars. There are five main pillars of their faith, and I want to run through those five pillars very quickly. Number one is a profession of faith. They profess, they confess and profess there to be just one God. So they are similar to Jews and to Christians in that way. They profess that there is one God. And then they take that a little bit further in their profession that Muhammad is God's final prophet. We disagree with that. We do believe in one God, but we don't see Muhammad uh, as a way of uh, correcting the New and Old Testament as the Muslims believe. But pillar number one, a profession of faith. Pillar number two is prayer. For Muslims, they are uh, required to pray five times a day, beginning before the sun comes up and ending about an hour and a half after the sun goes down. And then there's three times uh, in between, sun up and sun down. They pray five times a day. That's similar to some of our teaching. Jesus calls us to pray without ceasing. The Bible tells us to pray always. And so uh, I think it would be a good idea if we would have five times when we would stop deliberately or even more where we would pray to God. So prayer is pillar number two. Pillar number three, charity. Muslims believe that a portion of their annual income is to be given away to the poor or the less fortunate. So profession of faith, prayer, charity. Pillar number four is fasting. Fasting. Muslims fast on a regular basis as a, as a way to assist them in their spiritual journey, most often during the holy month of Ramadan. Ramadan is a month during their calendar year uh, where Muhammad uh, is said to have had his first revelation from God. So that's why that is a holy month and they fast during the month of Ramadan from sunup until sundown. That's pillar number four. Pillar number five is this, pilgrimage. Pilgrimage. For Muslims, it is important for them at least once in their lifetime to make a journey or a pilgrimage to Mecca. Mecca is the birthplace of Muhammad, their prophet. And so those that are financially able and those that are physically able are to make a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in their life. During, and during that time, there are certain rituals that are done while they are there. And each year, there's an estimated about two million Muslims that make their way from around the world uh, to Mecca to carry out this pilgrimage at least once in their life. Those are the five pillars. Now, I could say, and I think you'd agree with me, that those five pillars are not uncommon to our way of thinking and some of the teaching and practices that we have in Christianity. There's some similarities, a profession of faith that there is one God, praying five times a day. As I said, Jesus teaches us to pray always without ceasing. Fasting is part of our tradition too, especially uh, during the season of Lent. It assists us in our uh, spiritual journey. Giving to the poor, charity, causes, giving to causes that uplift and help 
others. That's part of what we do all the time. And then pilgrimage, number five, I think it's important if we're able to sometime to get to the Holy Land, to walk where Jesus walked and to see those sights. It strengthens our spirituality and our faith in Christ. So those five pillars of Islam, I think good and beneficial teachings, similar to a degree to a lot of the practices and teachings we have with Christianity. And it's important for us to understand that and to know that there are some things that we have in common with Islam. But there are disagreements, and I want to get into that a little bit now. There are some disagreements, and of course the biggest disagreement is with Jesus. How it is that we view Jesus. How it is that they view Jesus. Um, Jesus, of course, for us, is the very Son of God. Jesus is the Word made flesh. Muslims believe that Jesus lived, that Jesus was a prophet, that Jesus was a good teacher. The Quran even states that he was born of the Virgin Mary. They believe that. That goes even further than Judaism does. Judaism will not adhere to Jesus being born of a virgin. The Muslims do. Um, remember that Muhammad studied the New Testament. He knew it very well. The Quran records Jesus doing certain miracles. They are changed a little bit in the Quran as to what we have in our scripture. But for the religion of Islam, that's where it stops with Jesus. And as you know, central for our faith, central for Christianity, is a trust that Jesus is God with us, Emmanuel, God with us. When he was born, you shall call his name Emmanuel. This is God's word made flesh. In Jesus, we see quite clearly God the Father, the one who created us all. Jesus is God's presence, and through Christ, and only through Christ, through faith in him, by God's grace, accessed by our trust and our faith. You and I are set free in this world to have abundant living, to live for the sake of God, to live for the sake of others. And we have the promise, just as Jesus died and was raised to new life through him and through faith in him, we know that we have the gift of eternal life. This is much different than the Muslim's belief about Jesus. So that is one of the main disagreements. We simply have to say we don't agree on that. We do not believe what you believe. Ours goes further than that. Muhammad denies that God showed up in the flesh. He doesn't believe that. In fact, the Trinity to Muhammad seemed like three gods. And so he said this Christian view of Trinity, he denied it. He didn't believe it. He said that God doesn't show himself by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He thought that was three gods in three ways. For us, that's extremely important. We know that God has revealed himself in different ways to us and is present with us even now through his Holy Spirit. For Muhammad and Islam, they teach that Jesus didn't die that he didn't go to the cross, that he simply ascended into heaven before the cross. And for the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and certainly for Paul and the letters and the other writers of the New Testament, and certainly central for us, the cross of Jesus Christ is essential. So we simply say we disagree. The cross of Jesus takes our sins, as we heard with the children today, puts them to death. The power of sin, the power of death is defeated once and for all by Jesus on the cross. And so to deny Jesus' death on the cross really uh, undermines what we believe as Christians. And Muhammad could not get that far. So we simply say, we disagree. And it's a major disagreement. One more thing quickly, a disagreement. The Quran for Muslims is God's holy word. It is sacred. It is God's final and definitive word. We don't believe that while maybe Muhammad was sincere that he heard something, that he felt something. We don't believe that his recitations are God's sacred word. We don't believe that there was any corrective needed to our Old Testament and to our New Testament. Those stories didn't need to be changed. They were uh, inspired by God and by his Holy Spirit. And for us as Christians, as holy as our Bible is, the final and definitive word for us is not a book. It is a person, and that's Jesus, the Word made flesh. So for us, we see everything through the lens of Christ, who is God's Word, and that's a major disagreement that we have. We can, we can uh, interpret the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus and know that Jesus is the final and definitive Word for us, uh, not a book like in the Koran. So as I wrap up today, I just want to do one more thing. And that is to address what is, I think, a big question 
understandably so, for Christians and for others about Islam. And that is the question of violence and the question of violent passages in the Quran. Now, if you're old enough, you, like me, still have images in your head of airplanes flying into the World Trade Center building on September 11, 2001. And when that was happening, there were some radical Arabs that were chanting, God is great, in Arabic. Terrorism, as you know, is alive and well around our globe. And of course, we denounce it and we condemn it in all of its forms. Whether it's trucks running over people in the busy city streets, or whether it's madmen shooting down on a Las Vegas concert-going crowd, it all wreaks terror, and it goes against God's wishes for our world. Christianity is very honest about that, and that's what I love, one of the things I love about our scriptures in Christianity. It says very clearly that we live in a broken world. We live in a sinful world, and unfortunately, this world has some mad people within it. So we get warned about Muslims because of some of those violent passages and some because of some of that terrorism. We get warned and scared by things like a Jihad Watch website. I think it's easy to scare people about other people who maybe believe differently than we do and dress differently than we do, especially when we don't spend time together with them. But the reality of Islam is this that an enormously vast majority of the 1.8 billion Muslims in this world categorically condemn that kind of violence. They condemn it like we do. The violent mad groups of radical Islam are fringe groups that do not represent most of Islam around the world. ISIS, for example, takes the idea, the Islamic idea of jihad, which for most Muslims means a striving against obstacles in their life, a striving against sin or sinful behavior or habits in their life. They strive to live a better life. That's what, at least part of what jihad is about. But these radical groups take jihad, they take it and they, uh, they turn it into revenge, they turn it into killing. And we condemn that, no question about it. ISIS and other groups have killed by estimation that I was digging into approximately 2,000 Westerners, 2,000 people in our Western world, which is awful and we condemn it. But did you know that ISIS has also killed about 165,000 other Muslims within their own countries? This makes them to be radical and not really followers of what Islam teaches, because Islam teaches, in the Quran anyway, that Muslims are not to do harm to other Muslims. Yet these groups have killed 165,000 other Muslims and counting in the name of power and control. Now I think that Jesus, as God's most definitive word on this, definitive word on everything in our world, has a lot to say about it, and I think Jesus gets it right. He has the best view. He says this. He says, love your neighbor. He says things like, pray for those who persecute you. He says, turn the other cheek. We may seem that to be hard. We may think it's difficult teaching. It is difficult teaching, but this is God in the flesh saying these things. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus wants to turn this world that has been turned upside down by sin upside down by terrorism, upside down by violence, and he wants to turn it right side up again to, more, to better reflect God's will in this world. And Jesus models that in his life. He teaches that in his life. And even when he goes to the cross, what does Jesus do? He prays for those. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He prays for those who are nailing the nails through his hands and through his feet. You see, for Jesus, that is the only strategy that ultimately will win in the end. And so, most Muslims put those violent passages in the Quran back into their original context with those wars going on when Muhammad was living. It's just like we do with the Old Testament. There's some similarities with the violent passages in the Quran and the violent passages in the Old Testament. Did you know that there are some violent, violent passages in our scriptures in the Old Testament? Listen to this in Deuteronomy 13. It says this, 
If your wife or children say, come, let us worship another god, you are to kill them with your own hands. It's right in our Bible. The Torah in our Bible says this, if a priest has a daughter who is a prostitute, you are to burn her alive. That's awful stuff. That's terrible stuff in our scripture. And what do we as Christians do with that? If anybody saying they were Christian was living that out, burning people alive or killing people, we would say they are a radical fringe group not representing Christianity. Because we as Christians see through the lens of Jesus who says, I have fulfilled the Old Testament law for you. Now the new law and the new covenant is a covenant of love and a covenant of forgiveness. And we know Jesus is the final definitive word on such matters. And so we need to condemn those passages. We need to condemn those passages in the Quran as well that talk about uh, violence and doing violence to others. It's important to denounce them. Because of Christ, we know that that's not the way that God wants it in this world. I want to close by just simply reading an email. It's an email that I received this week from uh, one of our members, Aaron Schultz. Aaron and Danelle are back here. Aaron, thanks for uh, sending the email to me. He sent it on, uh, on Monday night, and uh, Aaron and family were in church this past Sunday, and we started this series, and we took a look at Judaism and talking about understanding our neighbors and loving our neighbors. And so Aaron sent this email, and of course I have permission from him to share it with you. <clears throat> but um, we can put the picture of Aaron too. Uh, Aaron has, uh, is there in the center, and he has uh, served our country very, very well uh, in our military in this country. And uh, he just writes these words. Uh, he says, good evening, Tim. I hope all is well with you and your family. He says, we were at church Sunday, and your sermon, Love Your Neighbors, made me think of my experience with Islam and the Muslim culture when I was deployed to Afghanistan from 2010 and 2011. Anyways, we became good friends with some shopkeepers. Uh, there they are, a couple of them, on our base in Kabul. We always greeted them with, uh, Aaron, can you shout out how that greeting goes? Okay, I don't know if I could pronounce that, so I wanted you to, wanted you to do it since you're here. Uh, but they would greet one another with that greeting, peace upon you. Uh, this was a common greeting uh, among them. We met with them on a regular basis to discuss family, to learn more about their country, to learn more about their beliefs. Many times we would meet during uh, lunch and we'd prepare lamb and rice and bread and tea with them. This was the most popular meal for the Afghanistan people. You could say that we broke bread with our new neighbors. It was great visiting with them. As a matter of fact, uh, when I learned about their families, I had soccer balls and Barbie dolls shipped to me so that they could uh, give them to their children during Christmas. And he says, of course, we had to explain Christmas and were able to share what Christmas meant and the coming of Jesus. And uh, they understood that it maybe was similar to some of the celebrations they do during the month of Ramadan in their culture. They understood soccer, uh, but they didn't understand American football. And we shared many laughs talking about the American culture and traditions. And Aaron ends this email with these words. He says, they were very happy to have Americans in their country to rid the world of the brutal Taliban soldiers. My overall impression with these Muslim men is that they want the same as you and me, peace, happiness, and loving families. I think as we get to know one another, just as Aaron had the opportunity to do in Afghanistan, as we get to know people who, yes, have some major, major disagreements in the faith with we do, and it's important for us to claim our faith and to share it and to say it and to tell it, to tell of the hope that we have within us in Jesus Christ, but it's also important for us to learn from our neighbors, to understand them. And as we do that, as Aaron did and as you and I have opportunity to do, not just with, with Jews or Muslims, but others who have different beliefs, this world in which there are a lot of barriers, we put up a lot of barriers, man-made barriers and walls between people. And I think God calls us to an understanding of one another, that we can begin to break down those walls, that we can see some of the fears or misunderstandings that we may have uh, may not be accurate as we get to know one another. So this message on Islam is simply a way of 
kind of wetting your whistle if you didn't know a lot about it, maybe to dig in and to maybe even uh, get to know some of uh, your Muslim neighbors in a better way. Thanks, Aaron, for uh, sharing that uh, and allowing us to share that today. Um, so this week, Islam. Next week, we're going to take a look at Christianity. I do profess to be a little more of an expert on Christianity than I am on Islam, so we'll dig into that uh, next week. But uh, important for us to really take seriously that teaching and mandate that Jesus gives us to love our neighbors uh, as ourselves. So it's in his name that we say amen. Now may the peace of God, that peace which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.